Uh, with that, I want to introduce um, Drew Hamilton, who's joining us from, I think, as far away as anybody has joined us on a Nature Center uh, program, all the way from Homer, Alaska. Um, Drew and I go way back to looking at polar bears and Churchill and grizzly bears and Yellowstone. And, uh, and Drew is a, a renowned uh, wildlife guide who guides all over the world. And, um, and typically, he's pointing his binoculars and camera at bears. But when the bears hibernate, you have to do something. And so Drew um, has been guiding uh, expeditions to the overwintering colonies of monarch butterflies in Mexico for several years. And um, it is my great pleasure to be able to, uh, to learn from Drew about monarchs. And uh, so, again, Drew, thanks for joining us. And take it away. Hey, right on. My pleasure. Um, yeah, I, the irony of my location is not lost on me. I am coming to you from Alaska, which is where we don't have uh, monarch butterflies. We do have a lot of charismatic megafauna. Um, but I like to branch out sometimes into the charismatic microfauna as well. Um, I spend um, a lot of my time chasing brown bears, grizzly bears, polar bears, uh, things like that. So when the people who know me find out I'm, I'm into monarch butterflies, um, it, it comes as quite a shock to them. But um, my fascination with monarch butterflies started in fourth grade. I grew up in Iowa, and we raised monarch butterflies in the classroom, and, and my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Bach, he took us outside, and we released them, and it was this big to-do. And that impression that was left on me um, kind of stuck with me as I branched out into other things and, and, and discovered new parts of the world. Um, this passion for butterflies and their tremendous migration um, just just stayed, stayed. And so when I had the opportunity starting a few years ago to go down to the overwintering sites in Mexico, uh, I said, sign me up for that. And now while I spend most of my time running around the Arctic, uh, I do go down to Mexico for uh, up to a month every year uh, during monarch season. To, that's where I get pretty much all of my vitamin D for the entire year. And you can tell me by the reflective skin, an Alaskan in Mexico generally sticks out. <laughs> so, um, so today's talk um, is, I try to make it as comprehensive as possible uh, because it is a subject that is... You know, people know bits and pieces, but the full story is really what is so fascinating. Um, you've got this multi-generational migrate. When you think of, of great migrations of the world, you think of wildebeest, you think of salmon, you think of caribou, whatever comes in your mind. But I want to make sure that the, the monarch butterfly migration uh, works its way up into your top five migrations list because it is amazing. And, and a lot of people don't know the inside uh, story on it. So I'm just going to dive into it here. Um, the images I'm going to show you of the congregation themselves or the overwintering site, I have yet to take the picture or see the picture or take the video that actually captures what it is like to be there. I mean, it is, you are standing in this, this uh, primeval Oyamel fir forest at 10,000 feet in the, in the transvolcanic belt of Mexico. And it, the, the best way I've found to describe it is you are... It's like you're in a snow globe of butterflies, and as you're, you're in there with all these insects moving around, and really, when, when people ask numbers, they stopped even trying to count them a long time ago. They went over, they now fly over, and they measure the, uh, the abundance by uh, hectares. How many hectares of trees are covered with butterflies? Um, like this. Now we're looking at a tree that is just completely covered in monarch butterflies. So, for example, right here, we are looking at an Oyamel fir tree. Like, you're looking at it, you can't see a single bit of bark. You might be able to pick out a couple, uh, um, <laughs> a couple little bits of sticks here and there that would indicate that it is a tree. But that's the level of the concentration we're looking at. And I am by trade a, a photographer, and so I, I often come at this from, from photo, photographic light and depth of field and shutter speed perspectives. And uh, it's probably the most challenging photographic subject I'll encounter in any given year. Um, so what happens is you go up into the forest. Oh, now I need there for an example. Look at look at all those butterflies on the. Uh... So as as you go up in the morning, uh, and the the butterflies fly in response to uh, temperature. 
And so you go up in the morning when it's nice and cool and you'll see these, these clusters of butterflies just heavy on the trees. And then as the sun starts to hit them, they will start to fly. You'll see one open up, then you'll see another open up. And then eventually there's just an explosion of butterflies and that's when the snow globe effect will, will occur. You'll see butterfly, single butterflies fluttering around just trying to look. Here's an example of one trying to find a, a parking spot amongst all the, all the others, going from tree to tree. Okay. Well, so these butterflies congregate um, in, this, in these very specific locations in Mexico, and they don't pick them for uh, the scenery, though the scenery is very nice. They're located up in, at elevation between nine and 11,000 feet in what's called the transvolcanic belt. Uh, of of Mexico, and it's a non traditional vacation spot. I've, I've had people say when I when I say, "Oh, I'm going down to Mexico," they they their next they say, "Oh, I love Cancun." And I say, whoa, whoa, "Whoa, no, 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 we're going to a different spot of Mexico. It's very rural. Um, uh, you go to these these small small towns up in the mountains, and it's really a, a slower slower pace, a slower way of life." So down in the, now we're looking at a map, I hope. And in the bottom left, you can see that it's that transvolcanic belt that goes right about the waistline of Mexico. And these sanctuaries are located about four hours by car or by vehicle uh, west of Mexico City. So you fly into Mexico City and take a bus or a car or some, <laughs> some mode of transportation to get up to uh, this, the towns of Angangueo and Valle de Bravo. Um, these, these are sleepy little towns. A lot of their industry uh, relates to ecotourism. Uh, so these butterflies are there basically from the beginning of November uh, all the way through the third week in March or so. So that is their tourist season. Um, by nature, they're helpful, they're kind, they're friendly. Um, and the, the phrase that we like to use down there is apapachar. Um, which doesn't translate, it's probably not in your, your traditional Spanish to English dictionary, uh, but it means to hug with your heart. And so I'd imagine my friends down there are having a lot of difficulties with this social distancing uh, because that is how they greet people. Even if you're meeting for the first time, uh, you're going to end up getting a lot of, lot of hugs and uh, a lot of please and thank you and manners and polite. And it's just... Um, it's really refreshing. It reminds me of a lot of the the small towns I grew up uh, in Iowa. Like it's it's got that very rural uh, feel to it. Uh, for example, like here's my friend Mago. She owns the hotel where I go stay, <laughs> and uh, I I truly look forward to seeing these people every year. They really are uh, my extended family, and we communicate as well as we can. There's not a lot of English spoken, and my Spanish is is okay, but it's not uh, not the best. Uh, but somehow we still uh, still are able to communicate. So to get up to these uh, these monarch butterflies, it is quite the track. So for the first part, um, we do take the, the big bus all the way to Angangueo, and then we get in another uh, bus or an open back truck, and we will, uh, <laughs> we will head up to about 8,000 feet. And then we will climb onto horses and uh, ride up the rest of the way. Uh, the horses are all uh, led by... Um, Locals, it's another way that, that locals will capitalize and try to uh, provide value um, and income. So the butterflies and the tourist industry around it, this is one of the jobs that's associated with it is a horseman taking people up to see the butterflies. Um, now, <laughs> it's, it, technically it is horseback riding, but I like to think of it more as horsing around. If you just sat on this horse and let go, you would get there. This horse knows the way, um, which is, is good for me because there's so much to take in and I'm always looking around and there are butterflies flying around. And uh, so if, if you're in it for the horseback riding, it is non-technical. Or if, if a horseback riding is a hang-up for you, the horseback riding is non-technical riding. And then once you get up there and if the weather conditions cooperate and everything explodes, it's just, it's amazing. And you're in this snow globe, and the people that you're sharing it with, whether you came with a tour group or things like that, 80% um, of the people who visit these sanctuaries are from Mexico. So this really is a local treasure. Um, frequently when we, we're up there, um, it is school groups, 
and you're sharing this and, and a lot of the educational opportunities that arise from sharing a local uh, ecological resource with the students is, is, is a very powerful experience. <laughs> and you're up there and everything's flying around and it's the feeling that it, it conjures in me, I can best relate it to if you've ever seen just an amazing Northern Lights show like it is, it is magical to the point that you can't quite explain it. You can physically describe it, but you can't quite explain it. And it's just the energy in the air is, is magical. Now, to get into the more technical side and how to relate these to Vermont. Now, these monarchs that congregate in Mexico are basically all of the monarch butterflies from east of the Rocky Mountains. Right. So the monarchs that you would see in Kansas, the monarchs that you would see in Texas, the monarchs you would see in Vermont, New York, all the way up to uh, southern Ontario, um, all make this migration um, all the way down to Mexico. Now, you think of butterflies being these little fragile creatures, but they're actually quite tough and their numbers make them make them resilient, that they can make it all the way down to Mexico. Now, these. When you're looking at these butterflies, and this is something you can do with the butterflies in your yard, uh, there is some sexual dimorphism, so you can tell males from females. It can be tricky when they're all flying around, but when you, when you catch them on the flowers, um, you look at the female that's on the left, and she's got thicker veins uh, running through her wings and darker coloration. The male over on the right has those two little pheromone pouches that they don't actually use anymore. Uh, but it's just kind of an evolutionary holdover. So you can tell them apart as you're looking at this big, you start to pick out the different, oh, there's a, a male over there, there's a female over there. They are toxic to birds. Uh, this was an experiment that I don't think you could do these days. Um, but one of the, the primary researchers for so long on monarch butterflies was Dr. Lincoln Brower. And so he had this captive blue jay that had never had experience with uh, monarchs in the wild and fed make it a little bigger for uh, and and fed this bird some monarch butterflies and sure enough it toxic now the toxicity does not come from anything uh, that the the monarch itself creates it comes directly from the milkweed plant that they need to reproduce. Now, when you when you talk about monarchs and and they do go hand in hand, like if you if you were to put the range map for monarch butterflies and the range map for uh, milkweed and overlapped it, they would be virtually identical. Um, the northern extent of the milkweed plant plants there are, there are a bunch of different kinds of milkweed is the northern extent for the monarch butterfly. There are a few things that have uh, have learned to eat them, uh, particularly down in Mexico when they are available in such concentration. Um, you've got the black-headed grosbeak, and frankly, this bird is just tough. Um, they have uh, <laughs> they have uh, adapted to this these toxins to the point that they can just pretty much chomp the whole thing and power through it. Um, the black-backed oriole, you can see they've got that very uh, uh, pointy beak. And what they will do is they will actually um, make an incision along the abdomen and, and go in and, and slurp out the guts. Uh, and then on the forest floor, you've got the black-eared mouse. And when these butterflies are congregated in, you know, hundreds of millions of butterflies, it really is a field day for the little black-eared mouse. And they'll scurry around, usually at night, on the forest floor and, uh, and eat their fill. And you can actually tell they'll they'll eat the ins they, nobody really eats the wings. There's no nutritional value in the wings, but the, the body does. If you're willing to power through the toxins, uh, so because they have this reputation for being toxic and being poisonous, there are a lot of non-poisonous uh, creatures out there that try to mimic their coloration and. By doing so, protect themselves from predation. Um, you've got the, the viceroy, uh, you've got the soldier, you've got the queen butterflies. Um, now, the viceroy in particular, so in the upper right is the monarch. And you'll notice that the banding is a little different, and there are subtle things you can look at to tell the difference. But um, it can be so hard to tell that it even fooled the government of Mexico. Um, now, 
the monarch is a symbol of Mexico, and it's got symbolism going way back all the way to the Aztecs. Um, when an Aztec soldier died in battle, uh, it was believed that their soul was released as a butterfly, and they were wanting to represent the monarchs on the old 50 peso note. And if you go through, if you have any old currency from an old trip to Mexico and you pull out an old 50 and you look at it, they were trying to put a monarch on it, but they actually put a viceroy uh, butterfly. You can tell by the banding along the wings that it's not the correct animal. Now, this is, this is really the part that hooked me. Um, and you look at their life stages, because this is the part that I, I saw firsthand way back in fourth grade in uh, Mrs. Botke's uh, class in Iowa Falls, Iowa. So she raised milkweed in her yard specifically so she could go out and find these tiny eggs and the monarchs will lay several hundred eggs per female and they lay them on the monarch or the, the milkweed leaves where these caterpillars will emerge and they will basically turn into eating machines and they will grow to several thousand times their starting body mass. So if they lay too many eggs on one leaf, it turns into a cannibalism situation because they just eat, 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 whatever is in front of them. And so they will eat the leaf, they'll work their way up all on the same plant. They will form their, their chrysalis and the emergence will happen all on this same milkweed plant. Now I can't stress this enough. This has to happen on the milkweed plant. And that's why uh, they, you know, when anybody talks about monarch conservation, they talk about preserving milkweed. And it is just in this stage that they require the milkweed. Once they become an adult butterfly, they won't use the milkweed again until it's time for them to reproduce and lay eggs. The mating uh, happens down in, in, well, it happens all over uh, in various stages, but it is quite the process. And if we go down to Mexico in March as they're starting uh, to think about heading north again. You do see a lot of mating. They've got specialized legs in the back that will actually clasp on. And the males are the ones, uh, as it tends to be with species, I guess, um, that, get, <laughs> that get the most worked up of, about it. When, the, when mating season comes upon them, uh, the males will start latching onto anything that they can get their legs onto. It could be a leaf, it could be another male, it could be, if they're lucky, it's a, a female. And they'll stay together for quite a significant amount of time and they'll fall to the forest floor and stay joined like that for potentially hours. And so, uh, particularly the last trip I was on this year, we saw quite a lot of this behavior and that would have been right at the end of February. Uh, I think I, I left on February 29th. So that you're starting to see the, the mating go on about that time of year. So the eggs, when they start out, they're just that, that little dot, that little tiny head of a pencil kind of size, and they're really quite hard to find. And this is just an example. They'll, they'll shed their skin. They'll get larger and larger and larger. They've got five. They're called end stars is, is the different stages of the, the caterpillar uh, life cycle. And the whole time they're eating, eating, eating. They do have some adaptations for avoiding predators. You look at the, the bright coloration, which is generally indicative of stay away, I'm poisonous. But they also have the, uh, the protrusions on both ends. So it's hard to tell which, uh, which end is the head if you're coming at them fast. And so hopefully they mess up and they get bit on the butt instead of the head. So there is still a shroud of mystery over so much of what the monarchs do, whether it's the migration portion of it and the multi-generational migration portion of it that we're going to get to here in a minute, um, but also the, the chrysalis itself. So they will... Uh, they will attach themselves to a limb or a, a leaf using a, a cremaster, a little gland at the uh, on their butt, basically. They will hang themselves upside down, and then they will shed their skin, and that's where they become this uh, beautiful green chrysalis that you see here. So as the chrysalis matures, and all of this, you know, people ask, well, how long does this take? Um, it depends. Um, it could be a few days. It's it's directly tied to temperature. Uh, it's a process of thermal accumulation. So if you're in a warmer place or you have, um, say, warm weather that is, is not uh, unseasonably warm weather, this process will happen faster depending on what the, the temperature is. Now, the mystery, what the heck happens in there? 
Now, this is <laughs> this was actually come up with by a, a medical doctor, not anybody that had any um, training in insects specific, um, but they did use some fancy medical technology to take a look at what is going on inside the chrysalis. And so it used to be thought well, there were all sorts of things they thought. They just didn't know, so they were guessing, so, <laughs> serious guessing. And this information about how the, the organs and the parts rearrange inside the chrysalis um, wasn't even, you look down in the bottom right, this is all from 2013, which if you're looking through the, the, the amount of time we've been studying, this, that's really recent. Uh, so this is all pretty new information. And... When you think about it, it makes sense. It's, it's more just a rearranging of the parts that are already there rather than breaking all the way down and starting over from scratch and rebuilding a different insect. Um, it's a matter of rearranging and um, creating the wings and things like that from, from tissues that already exist. Now, I I've, have such vivid memories of watching this from my elementary school days, but it was just fascinating to watch them emerge. So they would come out of the chrysalis, and their abdomens would be all swollen, and their wings would be crinkled, and they would sit there. And this is really where they're the most vulnerable in their uh, – because they can't fly. They're kind of stuck there. And basically, they have to pump their wings. They, they flap their wings there for – and again, this varies with time, but it is – you know, up to 45 minutes or an hour, uh, where they're pumping uh, fluid basically from their abdomen out into their wings, and you watch them just unfold and come to life. And then the moment when that butterfly first flies away was just amazing. Now here's where they become, they spread their wings and fly. This is where they become the butterfly of, of myth and legend. So... Um, this is the stage that most people are familiar with all across North America. Now that you've got the backstory, you're qualified to understand some uh, <laughs> monarch humor. I hope this one's showing up. If you, if I can test your multitasking, uh, what's the status of the forest that is oh, frequented oh. by the monarchs? Oh man, you are testing my multitasking here. Uh, so. The, 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 the forest, the forest, the reason they choose that forest is not necessarily for the forest. It is for the microclimate that is afforded by the forest. And if you look at traditional threats to, uh, to monarch habitat, illegal logging and deforestation was a huge problem. And whereas you've got these, these people, the land is all controlled uh, communally. Uh, by organizations that are run by families called hidatarios. And so you've got like one sanctuary will be run by 27 families. Another one will be run by 100 families. And so the, the conundrum that or the economic question that they are forced to evaluate is what is what value is there in preserving the forest for monarch butterflies? And you look at things like ecotourism, and you look at uh, grants from from large uh, organizations that will actually pay them to keep the the forest whole. Um, but if you look at the uh, the trend in illegal logging, um, they're down to the point where really it's just maybe a hectare a year, kind of kind of an incidental take uh, in terms of the forest. Uh, there was a president of Mexico uh, who was from this area, and he actually sent in the military uh, to protect these forests to to combat the illegal logging. And you're through programs. Uh, the military is no longer there. Um, it's kind of stabilized the situation, and you've had a lot of um, nonprofits step in. Um, to try and, and work with locals and mediate between locals and government and, and different uh, levels of authority to basically stop the, the, the poaching, the, the tree poaching. Drew, do you have any idea? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, I'm gonna keep putting you uh, to the test here. Um, how about the non-migratory population in Monterey? Somebody's asking if you know how the California population is doing. So that is an unfortunate story. Um, so those are still a migratory population. 
uh, it is basically, you know, I mentioned that the, these monarchs in Mexico are all the ones east of the Rocky Mountains. All of them west of the Rocky Mountains go to those eucalyptus groves uh, in California. And um, there were basically their, their population is so depressed that they are worried about the future of that Western population of, of monarchs. There were a few shining stars in the, in the California scene this year around Pismo. Um, they had 10 times as many as they had the year before, but that's all relative because the numbers before had been so diminished that it still isn't. If, if, if it's someplace you'd been maybe 20 years ago and you went back now, you probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't even recognize it. Another question from, uh, from Allison. Let's see. Uh, I've heard monarch populations might be artificially increased due to human populations clearing forests, creating more field environments up in the United States, um, and thus there being more milkweed. Do you have any info on the historic monarch populations compared to, to today? One of the best Christmas presents I ever got was the original uh, 19, August 1976 National Geographic article on the monarch butterflies and you look through the images in there and the abundance that they were dealing with back at that time and it is amazing how diminished it is I mean even now I'm so moved by it um, but you you look at uh, like right last year was the best year for monarch butterflies in this population that they had had in uh, 16 years and they had roughly six hectares of forest covered by butterflies. But if you look in the not so distant past, even 30 years ago, um, they were up around 18 hectares. Uh, and then this last year, they were down around two. Now, six hectares is what they like. That's the threshold. They like to keep it above six so that they can, that's where they feel like, okay, we've got enough coming back that this, um, this phenomenon will continue. And when you talk about um, monarchs as a species, monarchs won't go extinct. Uh, monarchs are a tropical butterfly. There are populations in different tropical areas around the globe that are non-migratory. What makes this population of the, uh, the eastern United States so amazing is uh, the migratory phenomenon that they do fly 3,000 miles from Ontario down to Mexico. Um, and we haven't gotten into it yet, but it is a multi-generational migration. So this multi-generational migration is what sets this population apart from other populations of monarchs. Now, there are populations that winter in, in Florida and Cuba and places like that, and they're there year-round because that's where they have milkweed all year-round. You think about the milkweed in your yard, and you obviously just have it in the milkweed season, the summertime, right? So this multi-generational migration basically follows uh, milkweed productivity. So you're in the overwintering down there in the little blue sunshine in Mexico, and come the end of March, these butterflies will mate, and instead of using that for reproduction, um, a lot of the uh, materials exchanged between the male and female in that situation go to the female and she uses them for energy. So when they leave, some males will leave first and they will go up to, say, Texas. And then the females will be come along shortly behind. They will mate, they will reproduce, and they will die. And then those next generation of eggs will, on their milkweed plant, will hatch, go through the, the life stages we talked about before, turn into a butterfly, and go up to, uh, we'll call it Missouri. So from there... They will reproduce. They will die. Those eggs will then go through the process again and become new butterflies. And then the next ones will go up to Michigan. And they will go through the same process again, mate, die. And then the next generation will go up to Vermont where they will find milkweed, they will reproduce, and they will die. So now you are multiple generations removed from the overwintering grounds in Mexico. Now, as the days, you guys are from Vermont, I don't need to describe how the days get short quickly uh, towards the end of summer and into fall. Um, so at that point, when that day starts getting shorter and shorter and shorter, the next generation of butterflies that emerges comes out larger, and they don't sexually mature. 
And these are what are called the migratory generation or the Methuselah generation. They've got different names, but they basically live eight times longer than their immediate ancestors. And this is the generation that will fly all the way from as far as southern Ontario or Quebec, or I'm sure some of your, your Vermont butterflies will come all the way down to Mexico. And then they will find these spots in, in the transvolcanic belt in these specific Oyamel forests to overwinter. And again, it it comes back down to the microclimate in those specific spots. There, there aren't a lot of flowers down there, so they're not eating. There, there, uh, there are waters that – one of the theories on why they go to that spot is, well, the microclimate, but then also those spots are, are mineral rich. The waters they are drinking are coming right out of the mountain, and it is a mining area, a traditional mining area. Um, so a lot of the, the minerals are then ingested and put into the monarch butterflies – and it's one of the theories is they've got iron that helps them calibrate with their compass lines and, and uh, the movement of the sun helps them with their migration as well. So the phenomenon of this multi-generational migration is what's at risk, right? So you think about trying to get to your great, 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 great grandmother's house never having been there and not having the ability to have somebody tell you where to go. It is all just built in and innate and it, and it is what would die with these, uh, these butterflies if this migration were interrupted. All right. Um, this over on the right, it kind of shows you what I'm talking about. And it looks like you guys would be right in that kind of third and fourth generation, fourth and fifth generation. So, yeah, I'd imagine your butterflies are heading to Mexico. And what would be important for you to do, we'll kind of get into some of the conservation aspects of it here uh, without advancing and freezing up the slides. Um, what they need – so you, you guys, since you've got them coming and going – you need both the, the, the reproductive milkweed and you need fl nectar flowers. So um, you think of uh, you know just planting flowers in your yard that are available. And it does take a little research that you want to plant um, local flowers, like the flowers that uh, would be there anyway. Um, I always encourage people to, to not bring invasives into their yard. But in this, in this case, it will actually help the the monarchs of Mexico, which are also the monarchs of Vermont, by planting flowers, planting milkweed, and, and just making a good habitat for them to ensure that this multi-generational migration, or it's more of a phenomenon, really, uh, can continue. Now, probably the only thing more complicated than a monarch butterfly's life history is monarch conservation. Like if you're looking at this map and you're going between Mexico City and southern Ontario, just think of all the jurisdictions and all the governmental agencies that need to be on board with monarch conservation in order to have this perpetuate itself, right? So you think you've got the Hidatarios, those family-run um, businesses in Mexico that are – that are controlling the forests. You think about the, uh, you need to have the Department of Transportation in the state of Texas on board. You need to have the governor of Iowa. You need to have the, uh, the premier of Ontario on board. You have to have all these different governments, all these different levels within those governments, all making monarch butterflies a priority. And frankly, if you're a little butterfly and, and there are budget cuts or anything like that, um, monarchs are not the first thing that people people think of. Um, I'm, a I'm jumping around a little hit, just taking slides opportunistically as I can get them to pop up. Um, but this is in the example, this goes directly to the question of the status of the forest. You look back in that uh, uh, 2003 to 2005, and the number of hectares that were illegally logged were somewhere uh, like 475 hectares, things like that, all the way down till 27, 20. 2017, 2018, and through various programs, governmental programs, nonprofit programs, um, they've got the illegal logging down to 1.4 hectares, 
which is a remarkable drop. It took a lot of people doing a lot of good things uh, to get that all to come together. Now, now this is even before they get up to you guys. Um, prairie conservation is key. If you look at the Midwest of the United States and me being from Iowa, I was kind of at ground zero for a lot of this. You look at the amount of uh, pesticides that are sprayed on our, our industrial agricultural fields in the Midwest and those pesticides, whether you're, uh, you're killing just blanket all insects or your so that's impacting monarch populations or you're mowing the ditches along I-35 you know you're then you're destroying milkweed so um, that is hurting their habitat you're either killing the butterflies or you're killing the butterflies directly or you're destroying the habitat they need to perpetuate themselves so a lot of the conservation uh, efforts have been focused along the, the middle part of the United States to have that corridor um, now you're not going to turn the you're not going to turn Iowa back into a big milkweed field. Um, we need as people to have this industrial agriculture to survive, and so it's more now about finding pockets of uh, finding pockets of, of monarch habitat in there. And I'm looking for a specific slide that hopefully will pop right up. Oh, this is just saying the I-35 corridor in 2016 was named the Monarch Highway. The Iowa Department of uh, Transportation decided or announced that they're not going to mow the ditches anymore. Well, so, and as you look at, at conservation all the way through this, this giant swath of North America, and you look at the conservation areas, whether it's the, the oil mill forest down in Mexico, whether it's the, Neil, the new Neil Smith um, Federal Water uh, wildlife sanctuary in Iowa, whether it's Point Pelee. If you guys just drive all the way across New York State uh, from where you are, you'll get over to Point Pelee, which is where the monarch butterflies will stage before they cross the Great Lakes. Um, they, there's really been a concerted effort going on mm, in relative obscurity, but it's been going on because there are a lot of people that feel very passionate about monarch butterflies. Here are the, some of the historical <laughs> Folks, you've got Fred Urquhart, you've got Lincoln Brower, um, you've got uh, <laughs> Astrid and Carell, my friends who get the, their pictures taken with all these people. Um, but I really I wanted to end with what you can do. But if this is something that either intrigues you, you can contact me directly. Sean can get you my email address. Um, but there are things you can do around your house or around, say, your nature center that would make it more uh, hospitable to butterflies and ensure that this uh, phenomenon continues. Plant native milkweeds. Uh, plant those nectar plants that I was talking about before that the adult butterflies uh, need to, to be able to do this migration. Community-wide, you can limit, uh, limit mowing. Um, you can even, if you've got some connections over at your Department of Transportation, talk to them about how they can leave more areas wild. Um, so that more milkweed and more, more native wildflowers can grow. You can also support beneficial farming practices and, and not use those pesticides. Because um, while we talk about um, the industrial scale of a lot of the agriculture in the Midwest uh, diminishing this phenomenon, um, even on a local scale, if you're just pray, spraying any Roundup or anything on your yard, it can have a detrimental effect on these, these monarch butterflies. Um, you can get involved with uh, habitat conservation or tagging programs. Um, if you go to uh, Monarch Watch, probably monarchwatch.org, um, I won't try and pull up that slide because I'm afraid it'll freeze, uh, but go to Monarch Watch and they'll tell you how to get involved with uh, tagging programs. And it's kind of fun because you, in Vermont in particular, this would be very important, um, what they do is they have very lightweight stickers that don't impact the monarch's ability to migrate at all and they stick them on the butterfly and then when they fly all the way back down to Mexico they will uh, and they don't go pawing through the trees looking for these things but there's a certain mortality rate when you get those butterflies uh, that many butterflies in one place and at the end of the season uh, locals can go through and comb through all the dead butterflies and locate those tags and you can when they find them they'll report back to the database and you can actually find 
where your butterfly went. You can say, oh, that went to Cinque Sanctuary or that went to uh, El Rosario. Uh, so there are ways that you can stay connected through this whole thing. And what makes this so tricky is I, all the people I work with down in Mexico, whether it's the, uh, the people running the hotels or whether it's the, the abuelas who are there telling everybody to be quiet and watching, watching over the butterflies, they don't get to see the stages that you get to see in Vermont. Like one of my, one of my buddies that I guide with down there, um, he's, he's never seen a, a chrysalis. Like he, he sees a completely different, his story of the monarch butterfly is completely different than your story of the monarch butterfly. But it's all those stories that need to come together so that you can help save this amazing, amazing phenomenon. And if you're someone who keeps your old National Geographics, or uh, I'm sure you can go down to the library as long as you stay six feet away from everybody and it's open, but you can find this August 1976 edition and you can look through and just see what it was and take efforts to hopefully get it back to what it was uh, in the future. Yeah, just looking at. So I'm sorry for the choppiness of today's presentation, but I do want to hopefully motivate you to, I mean, hey, go plant some flowers. It's, it's a great thing for everybody, not just butterflies. Um, but I did want to answer any more questions that you guys might have. I think your point about, um, about it's not just about the milkweed. Um, you know, it's it's about planting native wildflowers in your property of, of all types as long as they're native. That's that's huge. Um, I mean, milkweed is great, but not everybody up here has the habitat for milkweed to grow. But, you know, if you have a little a little garden, you can grow all sorts of native things in it that will really benefit um, the adult monarchs as they're moving through. Uh, a couple other questions, Drew. Um, so, um, actually, one I want to return to from before um, is uh, the Allison's question about um, whether, I mean, what, what do they think the monarch populations looked like, like hundreds of years ago? Is there any thoughts about that? Is the monarch, is this monarch migration something that has been happening forever and ever, or is it a relatively recent phenomenon? Do we know? So there, there, there's, there's very little even anecdotal evidence about what it was, say, even 100 years ago because they are in kind of these tricky spots up in the hills. Like the locals knew that they were there because they would fly through the village to get to these overwintering spots. Um, but given that there are people in this area, they were remarkably hard to find, uh, the congregations. Because if you think about it, if you're looking for – a couple hectares of butterflies in a forest, which I, I don't even know how to estimate what the size of the forest was a hundred years ago. It is kind of a little bit of a needle in a haystack uh, kind of thing. So when folks like um, uh, Dr. Urquhart and Dr. Brower uh, went down there in the early seventies looking for it, um, it took some, it took some doing to actually find the overwintering sites. Um, in an amusing anecdote uh, related to that, they went down, uh, I think it was Urquhart uh, went down first, but it's in this National Geographic article, and they were actually asking um, for the wrong thing. So they were asking for Mariposa Monarca, Donde Esta Mariposa Monarca, when the locals knew them as a different name. And so there was a bit of a communication uh, breakdown that, that made it possibly harder to find than they thought. But if you look at the... Uh, uh, the historical perspective on this, and what we have is just the anecdotal stuff like that. Um, but if you look at it from kind of a ecological history, um, this would have arisen arisen from our emergence in the last ice age. If you look at uh, the the variety and the abundance of milkweed across North America, there's actually very there are actually very few species of milkweed in Mexico. And as you go further north, you get uh, better variety in, in milkweed, and you also get just huge untapped habitats that these monarchs can exploit. So this migration would have stemmed from um, the ice receding and new habitats opening up and this tropical butterfly figuring out through adaptation how to exploit those new habitats that have been recently uncovered by ice. So, you know, while the monarchs have always been there as a in their tropical 
exclusive tropical version, this migration would have been related to the recession of the last ice age, going back, uh, you know, probably 50, we'll just throw 15,000 years as a, uh, a general, general guideline on that. Thanks. Um, I have another question. I'm, I'm doing these a little bit out of order, folks, but um, Susan just asked, um, so Vermont's at sea level. The monarchs are at 10,000 feet above sea level. Um, uh, just a question about, you know, whether the monarchs can adapt to flying. How are the monarchs adapting to flying from, you know, sea level all up to 10,000 feet? And I also want to expand that and ask you um, a little bit about, you know, what, what's significant about the climate up there in those mountains that makes it a, a uh, ideal place for them to overwinter. So the monarchs actually adapt a lot better than the humans that I take down there <laughs> to the elevation, um, you know, because they, they are adapted to fly and a lot of times they'll be using wind currents and then everything that they have in their arsenal to their advantage. Uh, so they can, they can go, they can fly quite high and the 10,000 feet is, is no real problem for them uh, as opposed to me who I also live at sea level. And when I go up to 10,000 feet, um, I definitely notice it that first week that I'm there, you know, car carrying my bag up to the second floor and things like that. It, everything just moves a little slower. Um, so it's, it's not really an issue for them because they are designed to, to exist at, at multiple elevations, um, sometimes all in the same day. And what was the second part of that, Sean? Uh, just what it is that's so special about those particular hectares of forests that make the entire population want to go right there. Is there something about the climate, temperature, something like that? Well, it exists. It's, it's, it's very consistent, and it's generally between 50 and 71, 72 degrees. Uh, so that consistency is what it, they're looking for. And there is some question as to whether the mineral content of the water there gives the monarch something they need that allows them to survive uh, and have this navigational ability, uh, whether it's iron contents in the water, whether it's uh, um, just different minerals that the, the monarchs use that, that they implement in their navigation system in conjunction with their, uh, uh, we'll call it photolocation ability, like they can tell where they are based on the position of the sun. Uh, so I'm going to boil that down to temperature, and I'm going to boil it down to uh, minerals in the water. Potentially, are the two are the two big ones. Cool. Um, a few folks are hoping to ex hear you expand a little bit more on on like if there's any theories out there about how the butterflies actually know where they're going. Yeah, and I know it's instinctual, but is uh, anything anything beyond that? Any research? Any ideas? Yeah, it is one of, one of the biggest players is the position of the sun. And let's see if I can, like, if you want to know where the sun is in Waco, Texas on, you know, on say October 13th, ask a monarch butterfly because they're going to know. So it likely has to do with, um, with photo period position of the sun. And there's some, this, theoretical like the, the mineral content and the, the magnetite in their bodies um, can help them navigate along uh, magnetic lines but that being said um, there are a lot of people who know more than I do about monarch butterflies but as you dig into it the more you realize that a lot of this still is a mystery like it really is there's a lot we just don't know at this point. Um, but those are the two kind of leading factors in their migration and how they find their way. Um, sun position and magnets, all about magnets. Uh, Mary Ann's asking if it's okay to bring eggs or instars indoors and allow them to emerge, or is this not healthy for them? I have some thoughts on that, but I'll let you go first. <coughs> um. I think it boils down to there being a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Um, there are, say, commercial growing operations that um, have been portrayed in a negative light uh, in the last couple of years. But that being said, um, you know, there, there, there's something good about having them out in the elements exposed. 
um, you're not necessarily propping up um, the weaker of the species that wouldn't have made it anyway. Um, but I don't want to say with proper re without with proper research and doing it right, I'd imagine there is a way, but it's not something you just want to do without research first. In the uh, just so so in the fall, um, or I should say late summer up here in Vermont at the Nature Center, we do quite a bit of rearing of monarchs from all various stages of life. Um, and so when that season rolls around, get in touch with us, and we'd be happy to to share with you some resources, some terrariums, even you could have some of our milkweed. Um, I think the yeah the key is doing it doing it right and respectfully so that the the caterpillar has plenty to eat, that the milkweed is being refreshed frequently, that uh, this the season is is right, so that you know when the when the uh, caterpillar emerges from its chrysalis, that's not Christmas, um, you know, and and <laughs> below freezing outside. In fact, that happens a fair amount of folks. Uh, will call us in December and say, hey, I have a monarch that we've been rearing inside. What do I do with it? And I think, man, that's going to be a long flight down to Mexico. Um, on <laughs> my there by Christmas. Um, any other questions for Drew before we let him go? All right. Well, thank you very much, Drew. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us this evening, and we will see you next time.